Very good morning to you. It is Wednesday 19th of August. I hope you're doing well. Uh, just a quick reminder, don't forget to subscribe to the YouTube channel, hit the bell icon and turn on notifications because we're gonna be covering the FMC Minutes live from 6.30 London time, myself and the team this evening. So if you wanna join us and it's gonna be interactive, you can ask questions and so on, we'd absolutely love to have you with us. Um, but let's just look at the markets this morning, get straight into some of the main headlines and what to expect from the, the session ahead. And already we've had a bit of a break higher in sterling currency. You can see up here, we'll get these up in a bit more detail in a moment. Uh, but a continuation of the push that we had yesterday in cable uh, and also euro dollar trading marginally higher of course coming as the dollar continues to remain uh, fairly suppressed at the moment um, we're down well it's actually flat at the moment as far as the dixie is concerned but still within close proximity of yesterday's lows and certainly holding that weakening trend that has seen the bloomberg dollar index at least down about 10 percent from the where we were trading in March when the pandemic really uh, started. Otherwise elsewhere, the other talking point of last night, of course, was US uh, equity indices. And that's because in terms of the NASDAQ, if I just have a quick look here, the NASDAQ back up to record high territory. Uh, so now carving out a nice area of kind of support at 11,283, which was that previous rejection uh, the end of last what two weeks ago now on the Thursday and Friday and then we've seen it rejected on the 13th uh, and then also on Monday before the break that came then yesterday and we've just accelerated up beyond that point now likewise then in terms of the cash market all-time highs the futures market the S&P just flirting with that level which was seen prior to the, the kind of shakeout when the epidemic at the time really started to take hold. And 33.97 and a half, we're just around there in the futures market and the S&P as well at the moment. But very telling sign, I guess, on this chart. This is one I've referred to, of course, in all of the briefings over recent weeks. And you know the annotations on here are the most probably important things as to why we are where we are. Uh, and underlying a lot of that is when we were right at the base of this big correction in markets globally on the pricing in of the severity of the economic implications of the pandemic was the Fed conducting emergency rate cut, launching QE, then going further and just a few weeks later, open-ended QE purchases, large scale and multiple liquidity measures that were put in place. Uh, and this led to here. I mean, this isn't just the US and the Fed, but this is looking at the S&P 500 and tracking that of just generally global liquidity in the system. Because much like um, the Fed, all the other central banks have had to follow suit in order to ensure that you know, the, the system can function under stress uh, and that consumers and corporates can continue to access credit at a fairly cheap rate like what we've been seeing exactly in China this week in fact with them um, inputting serious and consistently large amounts of liquidity in the system so that commercial banks continue to function and they really are what greases the wheels of the economy um, functioning in a, in a correct and smooth orderly fashion. So the other things of course that we've had uh, with this whole equity rise not to go over it in too much we've covered it plenty of times before but uh, the main focal point was the US COVID situation that's continued to kind of, um, I guess, drop down the hierarchy of, of real pressing macro themes as generally new case numbers have, have remained relatively contained, particularly in those key Sunbelt regions. Some of the recent US economic data has been good, but not good enough to then detract from the point of moving the needle for the Fed. So you've kind of got this situation of the economy performing perhaps even now a little bit better than anticipated, but still with ultra accommodation from the central banks, which is only going to help the equity uh, markets at this point. Um, in the FX space then, let's just have a look. Um, yesterday, and remember the briefing on Monday when we were looking ahead for the week, we were talking about these really, it's kind of the make or break week for the US dollar, and certainly yesterday was very important because now we have broken through that long-term trend line we've been observing for quite a while in the euro I mean that 2018 summer high uh, we've broken there and then that also goes all the way back to that longer 12-year trend line that we've been watching so now you would say the the prospects is we might get a, a push up 
up until 120. Sure, we're only about 55 pips away from there at the moment. But then I guess the question is, where do we go beyond that point? And I would say one thing to be clear is, although early on in this acceleration, remember, within about a month, we've gone from a 113 handle up to almost a 120. Uh, when we talk about euro dollar, it's been a phenomenal move in the in the currency. Uh, but one of the key things here, yes, early on was over delivery in the likes of national government responses like in Germany in their fiscal stimulus, obviously European unity to some degree in this further integration with a European wide recovery fund. But uh, nearly all of the move right now is being dollar led. Uh, and consequently then it's not just a euro narrative and as the euro goes up an interesting thing to keep an eye on will be and I think it's contingent of we've got to get well through 120 up to 125 for this to materialize but that is the ECB coming out and starting to kind of sound ever increasingly more dovish in order to just tame the acceleration in this currency pair typically this has happened before in many episodes where particularly 140 those who were trading around 2013-14 will remember what we call jaw boning, which is the central bank basically trying to talk down the currency because for countries like Germany, which are heavily dependent on a lower currency being more favorable for um, exports and how competitive that they can be, uh, generally speaking then, um, when we start to see sharp appreciation euro currency, it can lead to then kind of verbal intervention in that way. I'd say really that's not going to become a real thing until we get north of 125. We've got to break through that 17, 2018 high for that really to become a, uh, a more tangible risk for the euro. For now, it's being dictated by the dollar is how I would interpret these moves. And likewise then for sterling currency, of course for sterling, you know, the, the GDP contraction was heavy that we saw. Uh, last week you've got brexit unresolved you've got the end of furlough coming up in october and here we are just racing higher in the british pound and uh, actually then breaking above a really critical point we've been watching for a while at that 132 handle which was what was capping really the majority of price action both pre and post pandemic now we've broken above there you can see almost like the uh, that coordinated break across these currency pairs exacerbating some of the further dollar weakness and then just pushing up cable. Uh, what is towards the 2nd of January, it would be in the high, which is basically a 133 handle here in the futures, 32.93. So we're trading around 45 pips away from there at the moment. On the intraday, we had a little bit of a price action movement on the back of some data. Uh, we did have this morning UK CPI come out and it was actually um, stronger than expected, 1% versus the expected 0.6, uh, the core number 1.8 against 1.3. Uh, the ONS said clothing, rising prices at the petrol pump and furniture and household goods made large upward contributions to the change. Uh, but the move in itself has been relatively short-lived. Again, we are expecting some fluctuation uh, in the lights of CPI uh, as we go through the coming um, months. Some talk about the risk then of uh, deflationary territory but I mean this data would be in contrast to that at this point in time but I think overall as I said the more lasting narrative I think is the one to watch about the dollar rather than sterling so much on the sterling front of course the other political thing we need to be mindful of is we do have Brexit that looming political um, story or broken record it almost seems because EU and UK negotiators are going to be meeting again um, and the latest in the FT last night was that Brussels has rejected UK's opening demands for continued wide-ranging access to the EU for British truckers uh, this just another element then of what has been sticking points on fishery rights and state subsidies and so the expectation for the outcome of these talks happening this week is basically zero <laughs> so don't be thinking that right I just you know that's the main reason I want to just get short the pound because Brexit talks are not going to progress no one's expecting Brexit talks to progress um, time uh, is a is a magical thing when it comes to negotiation and although a deal does need to be really made in coming weeks, really late September, October is the deadline if they really want to get it ratified for year end, otherwise at the risk of 
this kind of more messy, disorderly type Brexit situation. Um, that just means then that really I think compromise of any type of nature will not happen yet. So for the moment, as I said, I would continue to look at these major currency pairs on your view about the dollar rather than um, the individual fundamentals behind the euro and sterling so much. All right, well, look, let's have a quick run through some of the headlines. Um, quick look at this. And this is an update on the US-China side of things. And of course comes after, let me just transition my screen. This comes after we had that delayed meeting. So the update is, according to Reuters, there's no new high level trade talks now have been scheduled between the US and China. Um, the two sides remain in touch though about implementing phase one of the trade deal according to the White House Chief of Staff, Mark Meadows. So exactly what we were kind of alluding to in the briefing, I think on Monday, which is, I don't really think there's a need for them to meet. Um, you know, interestingly, to add to that point, uh, before I explain further, Trump said last night, quote, I postponed the talks with China. You want to know why? I don't want to deal with them now, Trump said. Um, and where was he when he made that comment? He was at a briefing in regarding to the construction of the border wall with Mexico. Uh, he then said, what China did to the world was not even thinkable. They could have stopped this virus, is what Trump said. So remember what we were looking at um, on Monday, underlying all of the, uh, the kind of bluster, if you like, in this type of rhetoric from Trump, is the fact that over recent weeks, China have substantially accelerated their purchasing of US goods in a variety of different ways, soft ag agricultural, energy products, and everything in between. The idea here then is that they are now you know, moving toward trying to fulfill um, this objective. So for Trump then, underlying this, he has got Chinese actively importing US goods. Um, and also I saw yesterday that the US and China have actually uh, updated, I think there was four flights that used to happen previously before yesterday between US and China. They've actually doubled that to eight now. That doesn't really sound like, to me, um, an administration who's really locking down on China uh, in that sense. So for me, what Trump is saying, obviously the context is, uh, yeah, in terms of the framing, is just perfect, right? He's, he's talking at a conference about the construction of a border wall. So you can really hit home the point about immigration, about you know the Mexican issue, about then China and the virus and how I delayed these talks. It's all just political framing and, and, and creating a narrative that would be beneficial for him in, in his political agenda at this point in time. No more, no less, I would say, from that. Uh, the one thing, though, that you have got that probably is worth keeping half an eye on, though, is that uh, the US has warned um, some US colleges to divest China stocks on delisting risk. Um, the move could hit billions of dollars invested in Chinese stocks. So I know this might sound surprising, but when it comes to um, US stocks, there's an incredible amount of money, actually. The, these universities in, in the States are big, big business. Uh, and one of the things here that they talk about is endowment funds, for example, um, and how they invest in, in equities in general, but part of that would include um, Chinese equities uh, and what this article is basically talking about is that foreign equities make up about 14% of college endowments and we're talking billions of dollars here uh, and Trump kind of putting out the warning that uh, they should be looking to unwind that and obviously there's a risk of uh, a lot of these Chinese firms being delisted in America uh, so again another way of which trying to um, put the pressure on China I guess to remain committed to what they have been doing over recent weeks uh, but again on a, on a surface level it's certainly then as far as being a US based citizen it would appear then that Trump is really you know got the got the his the pe pedal to the metal in terms of putting the pressure on which is ultimately a really important thing for him if he's going to come out and victorious in this election later on this year on the US political side, the other thing is, you know, we remain at this impasse at the moment with are they not or are they going to provide further stimulus? And probably one of the biggest 
barriers for them having struck a deal uh, over the last two weeks has been the fact that coronavirus is dropping in the US, economic data now has been faring better than expected more recently, um, and the stock market's at record all-time highs. That's the worst type of setting for people to feel pressure in order to compromise and cut a deal. As long as everything is holding up and appearing fine on the surface, it lessens the need for any type of immediate response. It allows you, as a negotiating stance, to wait you know, in that respect um, uh, and then just play this out. And so I would not expect really anything forthcoming of this anytime soon. Interestingly though, uh, House Speaker Nancy Pelosi did say last night that suggested that Democrats would be willing to make more cuts to their stimulus proposal to seal a deal with Republicans speed up the COVID-19 relief and then come back after November elections with additional agenda um, items. So one of the important things here is I don't think either will want to buckle but at the same time they can't appear to the public to be not willing to cut a deal of some sort because that deal does carry benefit for tens of millions of Americans who are at risk of unemployment, eviction and all these types of things. You know, so the Trump executive order is just one element and one area to support in that way that he did, what, two weeks ago. It really is contingent that more stimulus is forthcoming. And you know, neither party here is going to want to look too passive at risk then that they're not really um, helping uh, the public in this, this, this kind of troubled situation that is the, the post-pandemic kind of era, or during this pandemic, I should say. Elsewhere, oil markets, uh, the headline run on Reuters this morning, slips as demand fears outweigh strong US stocks draw. Uh, what they're talking about here is uh, we had a crude drawdown that was almost double consensus, 4.264 million, albeit do note the gasoline figure uh, surged the most since April, just short of 5 million. Uh, not too much in the way of any lasting reaction to that. What they're referring to on the demand side is certainly that um, will the economic story recovery in America be somewhat called into jeopardy and subsequently demand by the lack of forthcoming stimulus in the US and also this ongoing tit-for-tat kind of uh, slow escalation that we've seen in the US-China trade war. But I would say offsetting that has been the fact that um, China have been quite active in, in, in looking to buy energy products in the US. So at the moment, I'd say we're at a bit of an even... Um, situation looking for the next definitive kind of break in some kind of news to push us in either way and um, one thing to remind you you do have the um, JMMC meeting today so the Joint Ministerial Monitoring Committee and compliance with cuts according to Reuters sources on Monday is that they currently OPEC wide uh, compliance is around 95 to 97% in July, which would be, as I've said before, particularly high. Uh, any lack of compliance starts to jeopardize then the potential longevity uh, or effectiveness of the deal. So it's worth keeping an eye out for any comments that do come out, if at all, any later on today. Russian Energy, Energy Minister Alexander Novak, which of course is a key player given um, the size of production that, that Russia represents. He's going to be joining the video meeting. Uh, this comes despite him having a confirmed case of uh, coronavirus at the moment. All right, quick look at the calendar. What have we got? Um, as I said, UK CPI came out earlier this morning. Uh, was stronger than expected, but no real lasting impacts on the back of that. It's really about what does that look like going forward. There's multiple different uh, forces or risks facing the UK economy going forward. That's just one, so it's not quite the silver bullet, if you like. Um, and then going further forward into later, 10 o'clock, we've got Eurozone CPI, but this is a final reading. You've then got the Canadian reading for inflation as well this afternoon. Um, US-wise, it's pretty quiet. Uh, you've got the DOE uh, energy infantry numbers, of course, following on from the APIs. Uh, and then you've got the minutes coming at 7 p.m. London, so one in Chicago, uh, two in New York. So with the minutes, again, I'll be on with the team later. Um, feel free to join us. All you gotta do is subscribe to the channel uh, and then you'll get an alert as soon as we go live. But we're gonna go live half an hour before the event to give you a good thorough preview of what we're anticipating, what we're looking for. Um, 
Finally, speaker-wise, Barkin, late in the day, non-voting member, following on from the likes of Home, Home Depot and uh, Walmart, Target is coming out today for those interested. And then from a uh, supply perspective, uh, you've got a gilt auction in the UK, a longer dated bond auction, and a $25 billion and a 20-year bond auction coming out of the US as their issuance just continues in earnest at the moment. Um, yeah, that's that's it. I'm not going to go any further, and hopefully I will see you online later for the FMC, and I wish you a good day ahead. Thanks very much.